Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to just, here we go. Okay, so uh, I wanted to welcome everybody. This is the second meeting of the IPA Journal Club, uh, today featuring Dr. Jay Greenberg. Uh, I introduced myself, I'm Jack Drescher, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in New York City. And I'm also a member of the International Psychoanalytic Association's Communications Committee, which is sponsoring this journal club. Uh, for your calendars, uh, our next meeting is January 12th, and Dr. Beverly Stout will be discussing her paper, Black Rage, which was published in JAPA, the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association. Uh, our guest today, Marcus, could go to Dr. Greenberg's slide? Um, our guest today, uh, uh, Jay Greenberg, PhD, is a training and supervising analyst at the William Allenson White Institute in New York. Uh, he's also co-author with uh, Stephen Mitchell of Object Relations and Psychoanalytic Theory, a landmark textbook, and an author of his own book, Oedipus and Beyond, the Clinical Theory. Dr. Greenberg has authored more than 90 articles addressing issues of psychoanalytic theory, clinical practice, and the history of psychoanalysis. And he's also served as the editor of the Psychoanalytic Quarterly from 2011 to 2020. And before that, he was the editor for North America of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis and editor of the White Institute's journal, Contemporary Psychoanalysis. And then in 2015, he was awarded the Mary Sigourney Award for his outstanding achievements in psychoanalysis. And I would further add that Dr. Greenberg was one of my teachers when I was a candidate in training at the William Mountainson White Institute. Today, we're gonna to be discussing Dr. Greenberg's paper, Psychoanalytic Training and the Analytic Attitude, which was published in the Italian Psychoanalytic Annual Special Edition in English, and in La Revista de Psychoanalysi in Italian. And if you haven't read the paper yet, and you should, uh, we are providing the link in the chat where you can still download the paper. And Marcos, if you could just put the link to the paper in the chat, that would be great. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, La Società Psicoanalitica Italiana and their journal, La Revista di Psicoanalisi, publisher, Raffaello Cortina, for graciously sharing this paper at no charge with us. So before we begin, a few comments about the format for today. So the goal of the Journal Club is to be interactive. Uh, I think Marco has now the slides. The goal of the Journal Club is to be interactive so that the readers of the paper can speak directly with the author. As you know, the session is being recorded and will be available for viewing on both the IPA website and IPA's YouTube channel at some future date. If you do not wish to be recorded, please leave your camera off. However, if you do not wish to be recorded, I may not call on you to ask the author a question. So today I will begin with a question of my own for Dr. Greenberg. If you in the audience have questions or comments, put them in the Q&A section because we're not gonna use the chat function for that purpose at this meeting. And I will select questions in the Q&A section that I think might be of interest to those of you attending. You're, you're being asked to stay muted for this event unless you're called upon to pose a question in the Q&A section to Dr. Greenberg. And when you're called upon, please unmute yourself and then turn on your video camera if it's not already turned on. When you're called upon, please identify yourself and tell us where you're from. And also please speak slowly and clearly as not all the people who are tuned into this uh, uh, journal club are native English speakers. So I prepared a number of questions and, and uh, I'll start, Jay, welcome. Hi, Jay. Hi, Jack. Thank you for having me. Sure, it's glad to see you here. Um, I've, uh, so one of my, I'll start with, uh, I read this paper three or four times in preparation for this. And each time I read it, different questions came to mind, but I'll start with this one. One of my rather loose associations of the paper and based on my own experience as a candidate is my sense that in most psychoanalytic institutes, candidates are being selected and promoted based on their willingness to submit to the analytic authority of their teachers, supervisors, and sometimes even their own analysts. 
And yet you do define an analytic attitude broadly as one that invites skepticism on the part of the analyst in training. So I'll start with, do you have any advice on how a curious and skeptical candidate might reconcile the dilemma of being in a system that consciously or unconsciously promotes conformity and discourages curiosity if it is tinged with skepticism? You know, well, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have um, advice for the candidates along those lines. Um, I, I think it falls largely on the, uh, on the teachers, the analysts and the supervisors and the culture that gets established at the Institute. Um, when, when you ask the question um, in, in, in the way you do, Jack, what I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, um, let me, let me see if I can find it, uh, Balance comments uh, in his critique of uh, the training system. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll quote it since I know that not everybody has uh, had the chance to read the article. Um, but Balin warned that, and this is a quote, the esoteric aim of our training system is to teach candidates to renounce part of their self-assertion and independence and to accept an authority with the right and duty of instructing and warning. He blamed candidates for being easily over, this is also a quote, being easily overawed and dependent, not being honestly critical and respecting us too much. Quickly adding that, quote, still graver is the charge against us training analysts. So I, I think that he really put his finger on the problem when he said that the, uh, that the, 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 the source of the problem is creating a culture in, um, in, in, in which uh, uh, putting aside our own, the candidate's own skepticism and ultimately the candidate's own creativity is, uh, is emphasized. Um, so uh, I think that, that the problem starts with us, uh, with us in terms of the way that we uh, analyze, the way that we supervise and the way that we teach. And if, if, we, if we teach in a way that encourages what we consider sort of learning a theory and a practice and what, uh, what can come across very easily as submission to authority, um, then, uh, then we're, we're, setting, we're setting exactly the trap that, uh, that I worry about, that Balin worried about and that I think many uh, candidates fall into um, of, of rewarding conformity and rewarding um, uh, uh, renouncing skepticism. I, I'll, I'll, I'll add on to that. Uh, your, your comments remind me in my experience as a, a reviewer of papers for various uh, journals uh, I, I've had the phenomenon of seeing what I call a candidate's paper, which is that the candidate has taken a class, they've been given a reading list, and they take the paper and they take whatever their clinical presentation is, and they fit it into whatever readings they did in that class. And 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 so like you know I'll see so 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 I people send me you know journals send me papers to review for example having to do with gender and sexuality. And so I'll get a paper, you know, that's a, whether, for example, one, one paper comes to mind is, you know, uh, an Italian journal in which a, a, gay, uh, a gay candidate came out to his gay patient. This, this, this was a, you know, a major issue in Italy, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and of course, there's an, there's an entire literature on this subject, but the paper quotes all the, the people from the course that he took on relational psychoanalysis, you know, who have nothing to do with the subject and try to fit it into that model. So that's what, so I often see papers like that where, you know, where people aren't learning how to do literature searches, for example, but just to regurgitate back, you know, what they learned in class. Yes, I, I think that that's, 
the, the, the problem that we're talking about in terms of the uh, training model and the, and the way training is carried out also applies to, uh, to, to anybody who wants to uh, get recognition in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the larger psychoanalytic community. And certainly in my time as my long time as editor of various journals, I saw that a lot and always would suggest to the author of a paper that worked in that way that you, you start with something that you don't know the answer to and follow your own curiosity. Mm -hmm. And don't refine the theory that you were taught and that you think that, uh, that the experience fits into. S start, start with something that despite all your training, you don't understand. Yes, that sounds good. So I, uh, another question I had, uh, so one thing you said in the paper that struck me uh, was, this is a quote of you, theories of mind and narrations of experience are two sides of the same coin, and only an analyst who fully grasps the theory can appreciate the narratives or effectively carry out the treatment. And I love that. I mean, I don't know, there was something about the language that was very appealing to me. Could you elaborate a bit on that statement? Well, I, I think on, on, on the one hand that that is a, a way that um, that experienced teachers can sometimes think about uh, the relationship between theory and practice, that, that they have to work in the same direction, that, um, that only if we have mastered uh, the, the, the theory can we conduct a proper analysis? And once we conduct a proper analysis, we'll, uh, we'll see that the theory is valid. And of course, <laughs> there, there's a certain circularity in that that, uh, that, that troubles me. And uh, another thing that I said in the, uh, in, in the paper is that uh, that if when analysis or when analytic training is successful, uh, that candidates learn a lot more than they're taught. And that that's the kind of attitude that I, I, I talked about that when I was addressing uh, Sandler's uh, famous paper where he, where he talks about uh, uh, people having private theories and that the private theories are very different uh, than the public theories that, uh, so, so I'm, um, I'm really advocating uh, that we encourage our, private, our, our students' private theories mm -hmm. and that that's also true of, about their sense of themselves because of course it, it also plays into uh, how how people think of themselves and how people coming through an analysis change the ways that they're thinking about themselves. Hopefully, it's not that they line up so clearly with the received theory, but it's that they use the way that we're taught to think as a way of uh, deepening, expanding uh, our, our sense of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have some questions in the chat, so I'm going to ask the first uh, question. Karen Harang, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, would you turn on your camera and ask your question to Dr. Greenberg? Karen? Okay. I, I not, can't. Oh, there it oh, is. There you are. Hi. It wouldn't unmute for a moment. Thank you. Um, Dr. Greenberg, thank you for your paper, which I did have uh, an opportunity to read and enjoyed very much. Uh, so my comment question. Karen, is, Karen, where, where are you? Let us know where you are. Oh, I'm in Seattle, Seattle, Washington, USA, with Northwestern Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. Uh, so Dr. Br Greenberg, you say we must consider how we want to train our students to think not what we want them to think. 
And for me, this echoes Beyond's emphasis on ontology, O over epistemology, K, and adding to this uh, Grotstein's discovery of a truth drive in Beyond's theory of O, might this be part of an analytic attitude that we can convey to supervisees and candidates that is that the aim of psychoanalysis is toward truth ineffable as this may be and however this is defined if if you um retain and uh, underline ineffable um because I think that part of uh, the, the sense of our drive toward truth is also the idea that it's bottomless, that the truth is, is bottomless, and that we not that we not be satisfied with what we know. Uh, that that there is always something beyond what we're able to uh, grasp. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, to, to me, that's that that's that's central to the analytic attitude. Thank you, um, Rachel Newcomb has a question. Could you, Rachel, could you unmute yourself and turn on your camera and tell us where you're from? Yes, um, I'm from Orcas Island, Washington. And I absolutely loved this paper and especially your sentence, um, an optimal analytic attitude, either for students or for their teachers has no place for any singular answer to questions about what psychoanalysis is. And I agree that teaching is one of the most important parts of um, transmitting psycho understanding a psychoanalyst. And my question is, why do almost no institutes require analysts to take several courses in study, pedagogy, and how to teach? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, I, I think that, um, I, I, I think that that's, that it's 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 always been assumed that if you are if you are a faculty member, you already know how to teach because you know what there is to teach, and that that our insistence on um, on, on uh, teaching a um, a received theory, which. Uh, which, which really started with the earliest institutes in the you know, in the 1920s, that it, it was assumed that if you if you grasped the received theory that you could teach it. I think that things have become a lot more difficult now because uh, as I as I as I try to uh, argue in in the paper, uh, I I don't think very well. I was going to say, I don't think many of us uh, are satisfied with the idea that there is a received theory, but that might not be true. I think probably too many of us still are. Uh, and and the, the idea of, um, of, of there being so many uh, competing theories in, in the marketplace has made teaching a lot more difficult um, because we certainly want to uh, communicate that what we what what we as teachers, experienced clinicians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, believe. I, I it's I, I I don't I don't want any of this to sort of uh, tilt towards an anything an anything goes approach. We all have we all have our uh, very we're, we're very committed to our beliefs about what what is most useful, what we can do best, how we can be most helpful, and, and also what's uh, conceptually most uh, illuminating. Uh, but, but I think in this, in this uh, world uh, where, where it's hard to any longer say that there is one theory 
that is hegemonic, mm -hmm. that we also have to temper the, um, the, our convictions with an awareness of other, of other convictions. And that makes teaching a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and um, I think probably, I mean, from, from, from my point of view, it, 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 it wouldn't be, it wouldn't hinge so much on having um, courses in pedagogy so much as it would be in, in, uh, in training people who will become our teachers to be, to be skeptical at the same time mm -hmm. as the committed. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, uh, also by the way, to be open to the students who, yeah. uh, who are not yet indoctrinated mm -hmm. and, and who have a lot to teach. Because they're not yet indoctrinated, they have a lot to teach us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, there's someone else I'm going to call on who has a Q&A, but uh, the, thought that, the thought that came to my mind is uh, the assumption, uh, and this within the psychoanalytic communities, you know, Freud did not want psychoanalytic institutes to be universities. So the, one of the side effects seems to be that um, every psychoanalytic institute assumes that all their graduates can teach every course that is required. You have any thoughts about that particular difficulty for the institutes, Jerry? Well. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think it's been uh, it's been very problematic, uh, and I think it's been problematic because it um, it, it, uh, it it doesn't invite uh, the sort of breadth of uh, experience that would invite skepticism. Um, at, at the same time, I I I, I do want to say that. Um, I, I recognize that um, that psychoanalysis is something that's very difficult to teach, because at at the same time that uh, that rigidity and uh, uh, sort of singularity of purpose is is a risk, there's also a fragility to what we do. That uh, because we're, we're we're working on the edge of what's uh, what's not only unknown, but what is feared and hated about ourselves and about human experience. And it's very easy to um, to to um, move away from that and to move into uh, a, a kind of theoretical. Um, uh, uniformity, uh, but it's also easy to move away from it and move into a kind of um, the, the idea that, that these, that these uh, aspects of our experience don't really have to be um, taken into account so much. So, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's, a delicate, it's a delicate balancing act. I, I don't know of any other discipline that has as the subject things that we don't want to know and yeah. psychoanalysis is that discipline, mm -hmm. and and um, so I, I I I understand Freud's uh, anxiety about um, about losing a focus on that and losing losing the the, um, the, the courage and, and and also the techniques to probe it. It's, 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 I think, as you point out in the paper, Freud wanted psychoanalysis to be perceived as a science, but it's well, that, not exactly it's not exactly like other sciences. No, it, it's it's not it's not like other sciences. I, I think if you if, if you if you survey the field these days, that that sort of becomes immediately apparent. I mean, there are just so many different. Um, uh, ways of, of thinking about human experience, which, you know, um, playwrights and novelists and people who study them, we all, it, so it's, it's not, 
it's not a science in, in that traditional sense, but even if, if we don't think of it as a science, even if we don't think of it as arriving at uh, verifiable conclusions, it, it, it's, it's, there still is a fragility to the analytic attitude and a fragility to what we're trying to facilitate in our, in, uh, how, our how our students think that, um, that, can, that can collapse into a kind of rigidity. You know, you're you're undermining what we're, you the dissident is under undermining what we the uh, the mainstream are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, S Suzanne Klein. Would you like to speak, elaborate on your comment in the Q and A? If, if so, could you unmute yourself, turn on your camera, I mean, tell us where you're from. I, <laughs> Suzanne Klein, I'm from San Francisco, San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis. Um, I was just commenting on the last um, questioner's idea of instructors taking courses on pedagogy, and I think it's a great idea, but I'm not sure about where everyone else is, but in San Francisco, it's quite difficult to get instructors as it is. Um, and maybe that's something to talk about why that is. I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but I was just saying that um, I think it would make it even more difficult to find people willing to teach if there was another hurdle put in front of them. I, I, I think, not not yeah. saying speaking to the value of it, just. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm I'm sure, I'm sure that that's that that's true, um, but I I also want to. Um, I, I also want to sort of underscore, at least my, my idea, that if we uh, if we are training people to, uh, to to in into an analytic attitude, that I, I would hope that that would infiltrate the teaching as well. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I, I'm, I'm I'm reminded when I when I say that of. Um, uh, I mentioned in the paper the course that I teach at uh, our institute on um, uh, on non-anglophone uh, points of view, and uh, the the purpose the purpose of that course is is not because it's a short course and it's a very broad subject. And, and each of these uh, uh, ideas that I, that I teach are complex and embedded in a very deep and, uh, and nuanced uh, way of thinking. It, it, so it's not, it's not that, I, that I think that I'm going to um, introduce people in a very clear way to uh, you know, uh, Italian post-Bionian field theory, or um, uh, French psychosomaticien uh, thinking, or uh, structuralism, uh, and, and and its various uh, iterations within psychoanalysis. I, it, I, I, I'm, that's not my intention at all. I, I couldn't do it. It would be silly. But what I am trying to do is just get on the table that um, whatever you think you the candidates or me the teacher uh, th there's always something else there's always there's always another way you might find it interesting you might find it uninteresting uh, but you can't ignore that people are doing are doing the same work with the same broad goal of helping to alleviate suffering um, and uh, they're doing it very differently than we are. And if, if, we, if we keep in mind uh, what, what other people are doing, we're, it, it's going to, I, I talk about it as nagging uh, in the paper. Um, I, I suppose I, I like nagging as a word because that's the way I feel about it sometimes. But, um, but it, it's going to uh, hopefully, engender a kind of attitude of this kind of skepticism, kind of constructive skepticism 
that we're talking about. And, and, and if, we can, if we can help people to get to that place, I, I think they're going to be better teachers without having to take a course in, uh, in pedagogy. Thank you for that. Uh, Joan Sarnat has a question. Could you, Joan, could you unmute yourself and turn on your camera, tell us where you're from? Can you see me? I have my camera on. Yeah, 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 we okay. see you. And you can hear me. Hi, yeah. I'm um, from uh, the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California in San Francisco. Uh, <clears throat> and first of all, I just wanted to say uh, to Dr. Greenberg what an important figure you've been for me since the early 80s, um, just a really um, important catalyst for my own thinking and way of working. So I wanted to express my you. appreciation you to you over the years. Um, so my question was um, whether you could um, elaborate a little bit on your own personal idea or fantasy about what it was in that example you gave of the Sullivanian analyst presenting to the more Freudian analysts. Um, what it was about that uh, Sullivanian analyst's way of um, talking about his or her work that registered with these analysts of a very different theoretical orientation as um, that person being a psychoanalyst in the best sense of the term. So I'm I'm hoping that you can give us your personal, maybe you were there, I don't know, but your, if not, your personal imagining about what it is that, let's say, between a Sullivanian and a more classically Freudian analyst, uh, what is the communality? I know you talk about the skepticism and so on, but... Can you say more about what that analytic attitude looks like, even when technique differs so radically? Yeah, that, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, and and, and of course, I, I wasn't I wasn't there at his presentation to that group, so I don't know what um, what came across. I I I, I do know him. Um, and what I would, what I would guess, and it's his first and foremost, his curiosity, um, his interest in knowing more about the patient, about what the patient was talking about, and his willingness to explore various possibilities, um, his, um, uh, his responsiveness and the idea that that um, that, that he, when when he in, when he engaged the patient, he was he was talking to something that had touched him in what the patient was saying, and uh, I, I think that's that that's certainly is very important. He 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 wasn't speaking from. Um, a, a theoretical conceptual point of view, uh, although he had one, but he was talking, he, he would talk to the patient uh, from, from his own experience of the patient, which of course was, um, was, was colored by all the reading, Thinking, uh, treat you know exp treatment experience that that he had done, and, uh, and and that he was trying to meet the patient uh, somewhere between uh, the way that the patient struck him as an outsider to the patient's experience, somewhere between that and between what the patient was trying to. Communicate. So he's trying to give a particular personal meaning to what the patient was saying in the hopes that, that the personal meaning that he was giving would be 
of use to the patient. And also having, having done that, that he was then open to the patient's response and, and not, um, not dismissing the patient's response in terms of some kind of theoretical construct like resistance or you know, that he, he, was trying to, he was trying to find the patient and to help the, the patient find themselves. I wanted, I wanted to say something like experience nearness, like the capacity of the analyst, whatever theory they're working from, to reflect back something of their own experience of the patient's subjectivity, which is an analytic attitude, I think, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, 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 I think that's right. I, th I think that's right. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm recalling um, very, very early in, in, um, in, in my career, I, I was working with a patient who I was having a lot of trouble with. And um, the patient at one point um, wanted to get a, consult a consultation. And so he asked me who I thought that, uh, that, that he should see. And I referred him to um, a very prominent but somewhat doctrinaire uh, person who came from um, uh, a very different point of view than my own. Um, and, um, it, you know, it strikes, it has struck me through the years that that might have been a little sadistic on my part, but uh, have, having some sense of who this person was. But I also thought it would be helpful to have, for him to have my patient to have a very different point of view. And I wound up talking to the consultant on the phone. I was, I was a kid for him, and he was a very senior person. And the, um, unfortunately, at least as he was talking to me, everything was out of a textbook. You know, the, the formulation was very much out of a textbook. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's the opposite of that, that I imagine this interpersonal analyst uh, sort of communicated to the Freudians that he was talking to. It was, I, I would imagine that there was very little theory in his um, in, in, in his presentation, although he certainly was, is somebody who um, was very steeped in theory and could could work very well with it. But he, he used his theory, but he didn't push his theory. And that, that was a very different experience than I had with this consultant. Uh, we have another question, a few more questions, which is good. Uh, Dorky Rao, would you like to unmute yourself, can you, and show us your face? And well, I see you're from Ann Arbor, where I went to medical school. Dr. Rao? Okay, maybe he's not on the call. Um, I'll read his question. It's a provocative one. Um, so he says, my internet is shaky today. My question is that Jay's excellent paper underscores, even valorizes skepticism. While this is indeed a useful antidote to rote learning, my worry is that there is not enough rigor in comparing and contrasting ideas old and new. This leads to every idea sounding new and innovative when many are in reality similar or identical, but clothed in new language. Also, skepticism itself is subject to becoming dogma and another rigid attitude. Your thoughts, and, uh, and Dr. Rao identifies himself as president of the American Association for Psychoanalytic Education. Uh, okay. Well, I, I, think, I think at some point, um... I, I, I do make 
the um, I, I do I do make the uh, the point in the paper that uh, that I, I distinguish between a kind of constructive and malignant incoherence, and I, I recognize that saying that that, that the uh, that, that what, what that means and what the difference is is not easy to put into words or to nail down. Uh, but I, 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 I want to be, um, I, I want to be very clear that um, that I'm not arguing for an anything goes approach. I also want to make clear uh, that I would um, argue very strongly against approaches that um, that 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 I I disagree with or think can lead in wrong directions. Uh, but and, and well, not, not but and also. I, I think that um, that the kind of skepticism that I'm talking about also uh, generates uh, a, a kind of comparative psychoanalysis in which different ideas are brought into contact with each other and that are um, that that where, where some of the differences, some of the uh, pluses, some of the minuses of each point of view get articulated. I don't think that those kinds of conversations or that kind of project changes minds in the sense that I'm not going to get um, a, um, a Bionian, an Italian Bionian field theorist to become an ego psychologist. Uh, I, I, yeah. No, no, or I was associate. Yeah, go ahead. Or an interpersonalist. I mean, <laughs> partly because I have tried, and I, and I I know I know that it's a fool's errand, but but also partly because that's not the point of the conversations. The point of the point of the conversations is to is to raise questions that each of us can hold in mind. That doesn't mean that we change and it doesn't mean that we replace our certainty with confusion um, but I'm, I'm thinking of something that I that I I, I did mention in the uh, in, in the paper um, and um, it's, it's worth I think it, I think it's a good sort of case in point in terms of the question, which is a very fundamental question. When, we're, when we are doing psychoanalysis, um, what, are we, what, is our, what is the subject of our investigation? What are we, um, what are we uh, paying attention to? Now, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Freudians, and the Kleinians um, would say we're paying attention to the mind of the patient. That's it, the people from both points of view are very explicit about that. That is our that is our uh, that has to be our focus. And if we're thinking about anything else, we're um, we're, we're abandoned. We're not doing our job. Basically. Um, a, a relational or interpersonal theorist or you know, a kind of neo-Freudian or neo-Kleinian would say, no, we don't just focus our attention on the, um, on, on the mind of the patient. We also have to pay attention to the mind of the analyst, to what we're thinking, what we're feeling, uh, what we're saying, uh, what might lead us to say what we're saying and, and so on and so forth. So, so the, the uh, subject of, of, of observation is very different if you're a 
classical Kleinian or um, a, a, a relational or interpersonal analyst. Then the field theorists would say, neither of those is adequate. What we have to do is pay attention to the, the, the shared mind that it has been created by the, within the field. And, and it, it, that's a very different uh, model than, and very different focus of attention than paying attention to the mind of the analyst and how it interacts with the mind of, mind of the patient. Those are three very, and there, there are others, but three is enough to, to, to show how, how, how different the, the fundamental premise of what are we looking at is. And um, hopefully, and maybe increasingly, we can have conversations with people who believe differently and, and start to um, start start to see what the implications of each of those fundamental premises are. Some people uh, I, some people think that that um, that that question can be adjudicated uh, you know someday um, you know I've had uh, I have one conversation with uh, uh, an analyst from another country who who, uh, who offered to bet me that in 300 years we would have adjudicated the, <laughs> the relative value of, of different perspectives. Well, I was, you know, the question actually, uh, Dr. Rao's question made me think about your book, uh, Psycho, you know, uh, Object Relations and Psychoanalytic Theory, where you do place the theories next to each other. And one thing I remember <clears throat> that the problem for me is not that people are putting um, old wine in new bottles, to paraphrase Dr. You know, Rao's question, but the problem is more in the field has been what I think what uh, you and, and Steve refer to as being accommodationism, which is that original thinkers like Winnicott, you know, could not actually be, you know, express their originality directly without sort of ratcheting into a pre-existing theory. And so you have the, you know, you have the notion that suddenly there's a whole pre-edible metapsychology which was not taken up by Freud. And then, you know, they should have slipped that in. And then once you sort of, you know, work out all the pre edible issues, then you get to the edible issues, you know. And so that I think is a bigger problem in psychoanalysis, which is that the originality of, think of its thinkers has had to be hidden, you know, in order to accommodate existing theories. Certainly, certainly that was part of Winnicott's development as a, as a psychoanalyst. Um, and, and of course, old wine in new bottles uh, was uh, a, a, a critique of the ob object relations book from the beginning. Uh, <laughs> people, people may not know that this book is now out in print for 40 years and continues to be used by many, many, many people. It's 40 you years know? right now. Right. It's, yes. it's not the next. So, yeah. um, but... I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a story. Uh, shortly after the book came out, um, the American Psychoanalytic did a meet the author for us. And um, there were two discussants. One was very um, positive about the book and thought it was interesting. Uh, the other, started out by saying the, the question isn't whether this book um, is well done. It certainly is. The question is, should it have been done at all? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he sort of telegraphed his answer. Uh, but it was, but the argument was an old wine and new bottles answer. This is all in the received theory. All that you, uh, you Stephen, they pr presented as alternative and radical alternative 
it is actually in the theory and could have just been developed uh, within within the framework. Um, I'm I'm going to call on the next person to speak somewhere, but but it, I'm reminded in the 1990s during the period of uh, what I call psychoanalytic ecumenicism in New York, when there would be a meeting of various people from different perspectives and you would go to a meeting and there would be a ego psychologist and a uh, cohesion and an interpersonalist and an object relations theorist. And, and unfortunately, the Freudian theorist would always begin with the assumption that the reason people disagreed is that they didn't understand the theory, and so they would then proceeded to explain it again. And so that seemed to be that seemed to be the way. It went. <laughs> right. I, before you go to the next person, uh, the um, I think it's interesting. So you you said that that psychoanalytic ecumenicism in the nineties, and I think I agree completely was. Uh, you know, Freudian self psychological object relations, make relational into or interpersonal, uh, you know, the beginnings. Think of think of what that would uh, at this point in history be considered very narrow and limited, because th those are the theories that are uh, uh, popular in the United States. Uh, we we now have, you know, as as I as I said before, the, you know, the Italian Bionian field theory. We have uh, Lacanian theory, much more uh, widely thought about. We have um, Latin American field theories, uh, we, and we have um, uh, Laplanche. The, the uh, the, the field of comparative psychoanalysis has changed enormously since, since Steve and I wrote our book and, and even since those ecumenical meetings. And, and of course, the, the, the premises of the different approaches are much more disparate than they were at, at that time. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, um, w one of the things that I, I um, believe very strongly, and I think I allude to it in the paper, if I remember right, is that, that when there are alternatives to the dominant theory in, that arise in a particular culture, the alternatives are always spoken about in the language of the dominant theory. So self-psychology, for instance, I think that's a very good example. Self-psychology, which grew out of uh, Kohut's break with ego psychology, is very much couched in the language of ego psychology. So uh, in, in uh, North America, and I think this is still more or less true, we, we all speak the language of ego psychology, even if we're presenting alternative points of view. But ego psychology is our native language. That's not true in Latin America. That's not true in France. That's not true in Italy. And so comparative psychoanalysis now um, it includes uh, conversations among uh, analysts who are dealing or speaking very different languages, both literally and conceptually. So, uh, Summer, you have. What, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, open, turn on your camera, introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Jack. Great to see you. Um, I'm from New York, from William Ellenson White Institute, and actually Jay was one of my supervisors uh, when I was in training. Great to see you, Jay. Good to see you. Uh, my my question is. We talked about the freedom of the trainees, candidates in developing their own theories, their own thinking. And we said culture of the Institute is important. The teachers, analysts, supervisors, allowing that freedom is important. It's, and I agree with that. We need to work on that, uh, our institutes. Another obstacle I find to the trainees freedom in this way based on my experiences teaching more junior psychoanalytic clinicians, is their own hesitation in going out too far. And the fear is that this won't be psychoanalysis. 
that is not psychoanalysis is a fear that we had to live with in the field i think we label each other's work as that's not psychoanalysis so i wonder if it's time to work on defining psychoanalysis more broadly and teaching that to our candidates and then as long as you do this there 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 is more room for creativity after that a grounding kind of experience because early trainees early on need that grounding they need to know what they're doing is okay um another is of course encouraging them but that's not enough sometimes some candidates fear fear going to rogue in some ways so do you have any thoughts about that well yeah i i i i think it's it's a very important point and uh you know, just to um reiterate you know, you know Balint was on to that point in you know at, at the beginning and 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 the the other thing um you know i I I um I I grew up too much in a world where I was told and our whole institute was told that we're not doing psychoanalysis and that we're not doing psychoanalysis um, either because we're letting the patient sit up or because we think that Sullivan had something to say about the process or because we're not seeing patients often enough. Uh, so I, I, I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of, 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 of being told, you know, you're not a real psycho, psychoanalyst or you're not, um, you're not doing psychoanalysis. So I, I think that that's, um, hopefully, hopefully that's something that, um, uh, that to some extent, at least, uh, we, we may be uh, getting beyond or at least having a framework that will help us to get beyond it. I, I think the, the more, in, the important question is, is what you're doing helpful in the way that uh, we think that psychoanalysis is designed to be helpful. Hmm. Let's let's look at what you're doing, what I'm doing, what we're doing. Let's let's ask the question: What what are your goals? And is is what you're doing? Um, uh, going to facilitate the achievement of those goals. So let's let's try to let's try to spell out what, what that, is it psychoanalysis, is it not psychoanalysis? Um, let's let's spell out what you're trying to do. Now if you and I are working together in in supervision uh, and we ask that question, we we might get to a point where I say, you know, that's actually not what I think, that's not exactly where I think I would want to go with this patient. Here's where I would want to go with this patient. Um, I mean, we can, we can all, I'm sure, think of a thousand different kinds of examples, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, where that might play out. And given that that's where we want to go, uh, is, the, is the way that you're engaging the patient um, the most facilitative way to get there. I would respond though with the voice of Heinz Hartman, who would say, you're not supposed to do that <laughs> at all in analysis. You're not supposed to have the moral the moral values that's you know the idea that you should you're you're supposed to have a goal other than understanding the patient. Well, but but of course, yes, that, that that's right. Now but that would be one of the that that would be one of the things that we could talk about. Um, um, because you know, I, uh, I I think about when 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 you say that, and of course, uh, 
Melanie Klein would have said the same thing. That that that's that that's the only goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think about a, a paper that um, it was uh, Shelley Orgel who was you know um, I thought a very uh, subtle and uh, uh, wise. Um, Freudian, um, but he wrote a paper. Actually, it's it's fairly fairly recent. I mean, it's probably from the early two thousands, two thousand, maybe even a little later, two thousand teens or something like that. Anyway, he he wrote a paper. It was actually about analyzing candidates, uh, and in in the paper, he said that one of the things that uh, we need to bear in mind, and this is. Uh, this quote is sort of emblazoned in my mind, is he, he talked about the limited therapeutic value of understanding and being understood. Mm -hmm. And that that's one of the things he felt that we all had to mm -hmm. come to terms with. And that sometimes, often, always, uh, uh, understanding and being understood has limited therapeutic value and and maybe our concern with a particular patient at a particular time is not in understanding but is helping is being more therapeutic mm -hmm. helping helping to, uh, to addressing the patient's distress and pain not in a way that is is anchored in understanding mm -hmm. but is anchored in something else but if we can articulate that Mm -hmm. Then we can start to talk. We can get away from this isn't psychoanalysis. Well, that, that was my thought, because that's what continually happens in the field. Once the therapist or the analyst moves into the position of suggestion or anything like that, you, you, you get a very conservative, this is not psychoanalysis response. I'd like to move on to the next question we have because we're almost here, okay? Uh, Anshu Jaiswal, could you unmute yourself and turn on your camera to ask your question? Yes, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, hi, where are you? Yeah, so uh, I'm in Mumbai, uh, uh, in India. I'm uh, training in the Indian Psychoanalytical uh, uh, Society in Mumbai, I'm training uh, currently. So my question is uh, uh, meaning not very uh, deep, but it's uh, something which is uh, uh, bothering me. Like, so that's why I'm asking you. Uh, so my question is, I wanted to ask you like, how would you teach a student if you see something like if you have a student who comes, a candidate who comes to you for supervision uh, and brings a patient and then it feels like something you, uh, you are saying something patient. Uh, Sorry, I just lost you for a moment. I can, I've got you again. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if uh, uh, you are looking at what the uh, uh, candidate has brought, you're doing a supervision and you uh, feel like something is like the working of a death drive. There's something very destructive in what you are, what the uh, student has brought. The patient is being very destructive, you know, as a uh, client has explained, you know, this very envious, destructive kind of a, a feeling. You, you get that, but you also think that, no, this, if you can also look at it from another lens, that this might be a deficit. This is not destructiveness. This is a deficit. Like how, I uh, meaning I'm just uh, trying to think about it. Like how Winnicott, Winnicott says that it's also deficit. It's not only destructive. But if you are also very unsure, you are a teacher, but you are also very unsure at that point. And then will you be honest uh, about it? Or will you be worried that because you want your student to be open-minded. You're saying you want your student to be very open-minded. But then you also don't want to leave them, you know, in a quagmire. I, I, I think my, my, my 
concern in a situation like that would be very different than, you know, is it uh, a deficit or is it um, a destructive drive? <laughs> Excuse me. My, my interest would be how, how can I best engage the patient at this time? And um, I, I certainly, um, I, I certainly would bear in mind that I think that the patients, that what the patient is talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking actually of something that came up in a supervision fairly recently, that the patient, the patient was being very destructive and self-destructive. And, and, and I would certainly want the patient at some point to become aware of it. I would also want, by the way, I would want the analyst to become aware of it because sometimes, you know, the countertransference comes in uh, very strongly in situations like that. And so if there's, a, if, if there's a difficulty in engaging a patient's destructiveness, forget whether it's a drive or not, just to disrupt destructive, self-destructive uh, behaviors, uh, it, it's also, I would also have to work, have to be working with uh, the analysts to help them understand their own countertransference and how much are they, are they um, open to engaging that destructiveness and maybe that to engaging the destructiveness in, in the analytic relationship itself. So I, I, what I would, what I would really be interested in is, is helping um, uh, helping both the analyst and the patient to get to a place where they were more comfortable talking about the destructiveness, where it became possible to talk about the destructiveness. And I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be thinking so much in terms of whether it's a drive or whether it's a deficit or, you know, the, some of these theoretical issues um, don't, they, they, they strike me as very abstract often and, um, and, and ways of distancing both participants, both the analyst and the, and the patient and sometimes the supervisor as well from the feelings that are important. So it would be very contextual. I, I guess that, that's, that's what I wanted to say. I, I, would, I, I would really be wanting to work with what the analyst's experience was, what the analyst wanted to say to the patient, could say to the patient, was afraid of saying to the patient, and so on. And that, that would, and, and hopefully we would get to a way of engaging something that was um, that was useful and, and that allowed that allowed the patient to expand their experience of what was going on with them. Uh, we're going to have to conclude in a minute or two. So there are some more questions sure. and comments, which I'm, unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to. Uh, there was one question about recording uh, from someone who came in late. Yeah, uh, th this meeting is being recorded and it will be placed, uh, the, the recordings will appear on the website of the IPA as well as the IPA's YouTube channel. And if you registered for the meeting, I believe an announcement of the recording will go out to all the registrants. So that will be taking place. And, uh, and, I, and I just want to remind everybody on January 12th, we will be having Beverly Stout doing a journal club. Uh, about her paper, Black Rage, from the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association. Jay, I just wanted to thank you, you know, for coming today. This was really great. I, I had a really good time, and uh, I hope you did too. I, I, I did, and I appreciate, I appreciate your structuring it and also everybody's questions, which I, I think are, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm very mindful that, uh, that I'm, that what I what I say about this is is somewhat provocative, and it sort of gets us out of safe places, because theory can be a refuge, and 
uh, and training can be a, re a refuge. And I, I think like in, in um, going back to the last question, um, you know, about death drive or you know, deficit, I, I think that, that trying to understand the, you know, to label something is, is a way of getting out of a very fraught experience that both the patient and the analyst are having at a particular moment. I mean, if, if, if there's a, a kind of destructiveness that's infusing the, the, the psychoanalytic setting, um, it's going to be uncomfortable for everybody involved. And theory can easily uh, come to the rescue, mm -hmm. but also, uh, and, and, and partly come to the rescue because it, uh, it distracts it distracts both participants. And, and I include the supervisor, by the way, because uh, the, the supervisor is, is, is always implicated once he or she appears on the scene, um, that, it's, that that theory can become a way of finding a, a kind of safe harbor uh, when things get hot. So uh, we're about to come. I was gonna suggest Marcos, may Please save the chat because Jay did not have the time to look at the Q&A. So if we can save that and send it to Jay, he can see some of the comments that and questions that people asked for your, you know, your, your consideration. And okay. Thank you, every, okay. And thank you everybody for coming and uh, see, hope to see you all next time. Thank you, Jack. Thank you.